something and a minute ago and that Sister Melendez was singing and uh, I've heard, you know, cultural differences that you can't get mustaches off of black folks. There's a cultural difference. You can't get mustaches off Latin people, the cultural difference. My Holy Ghost don't know any cultural difference of the book of Acts, verse 24. I've preached from these verses of Scripture before, probably never like I will this afternoon. I've asked Brother Beckton to read for me. If you got him mic'd up, you better. I'll send you back to Jamaica. Hallelujah. And I'm going to keep that little girl I married you to. Praise God. Reading from verse 24, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. Now, brethren, I commend you to God for the word of his grace, which is able to build you up, to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. You may be seated. I'm going to reach this afternoon probably into parts of different sermons I have preached in my home church. I wish that every man that preached at a camp meeting or general conference, we could set his family and his church on the platform with him while he preaches. I wish we could do that. Because it's men's families and deacons that will cause them to back up. I have seen men preach the truth and a hole in the standard until their wife rebelled. I have seen them preach it till their children grew up and then they changed. I have seen them preach it till some affluent 
member in the church grows up. And then, and then there was a change in the atmosphere. Now here, Paul is preaching his last sermon. I hope I'm not. He called in all of the elders of Ephesus. I don't mean some glorified deacon board. The elders were pastors. The church in Ephesus numbered over 30,000. It was impossible for one man to pastor them. So when he called in the elders, he called in the pastors over the church at Ephesus. I don't believe there was a New Testament office outside that of the ministry. The word deacon means servant. Paul said, I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whose deacon was Paul? The deacons were subordinate ministers that labored in the church under the ministry of the elder or the pastor or the presbytery or the bishop or the overseer. All of these terms are interchangeable in the New Testament church. Two of the deacons preached longer sermons. Stephen preached a longer sermon than Peter did and got stoned to death for it. He was a minister. Paul called these together. He began to preach to them. He said, take heed to yourselves and then to the flock. He was preaching to two elements at Ephesus. Now I'm preaching to two elements this afternoon. You don't have to agree with me. You've been wrong before. If you don't love me, I don't care. You probably won't be shouting very long. But I'm going to tell you when I leave here that I'm going to be pure from the blood of all men. For I will not shun to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. Hey, honey, this thing ain't going to be settled in a board meeting. Now, I give honor to the great general board of our United Pentecostal Church. But this will not be settled by them. This thing is going to be settled at the judgment bar of God. And we're going to find out who's right and who's wrong. And I want to stand there before God free of the blood of all men. Paul said, I coveted none of your silver. There's a one of your saints sitting in my church. Show him to me. If I've taken anything from any one of you, show it to me. If I owe you anything, tell me I'll pay it. I believe you got to pay your bills or you're going to hell. I believe you got to do what you said you were going to do or you're going to hell. Now, not too long ago, it's been quiet, quite a while. Wife and I and brother and sister Beckton flew to Fresno to a meeting. And as that plane approached the city of Los Angeles, I looked down and I saw a yellow cloud hovering over that city. I knew what it was. Not a drop of rain in that cloud. Not one drop of rain in that cloud. 
The real clouds were up higher. You could see them. It was not long until that plane settled down into a smoky, hazy atmosphere. It wasn't night, but it wasn't day. It was not daylight, but it was not dark. It was a disconcerting, lurid, almost a world of fantasy. And when I stepped out of the terminal in Los Angeles, I knew what was going to happen. My eyes begin to burn and I begin to feel a congestion in my lungs. It was small. Now, smog comes from many things. In Houston, it's chemical plants. A lot of it comes from the chemical plants spewing out of their smokestacks. But most of it comes out of the exhaust pipes of literally hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of automobiles. Smog does not just appear instantly. It's been developing over a number of years. There was a time when Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, did not know that there was such a thing as smog existed. But as automobile upon automobile was added to the streams of traffic and the freeways, each one contributing their little bit of yellow smoke, Till the thing developed, it would almost choke you to death. There are days in Los Angeles when people with heart conditions and asthma do not go outside because they cannot stand the atmosphere and the poisonous fumes that their lungs are pulling in, and they stay inside. But then there are times when a breeze from off the mountain blows that smog out to sea and the sunlight shines in the streets of Los Angeles and you can draw that clean, crisp desert air into your lungs and you feel like a new man or a new woman because the smog is gone. Now, during the course of time, in our ranks, things have crept in, in a subtle manner, insidiously, quiet, almost unnoticed, step by step, little by little, phase by phase, here a little and there a little. Till we are surrounded with some things today that is almost choking us to death. Our spiritual eyes are running and our spiritual lungs cannot draw into them the oxygen that we need to survive. I'm praying for a mighty move of the Spirit that wind of God that blew into the upper room, that wind of God is going to blow all of the smoke out to sea. And our movement can begin to breathe again. And our movement can lift our voices in the praise of God again. When all of that smog is blown out to sea, now... I do not believe in necromancy. That's communion with the dead. 
The Bible speaks against it. God is against it. God hates it. But friend of mine and saint of God, there are voices from the past that are calling out to me today. Now I'm going to preach voices from the grave that are going to preach to you this afternoon. I've felt an unction from those in times past. The words that I read into you this afternoon were the uh, words of a man that is lying in his grave somewhere. Oh, you hear me this afternoon. Peter is dead and Paul is dead. But there are voices and the words live in the Word of God. You're listening to a voice from the dead this afternoon. I hear so many things. I hear so many things. The parallel of that early apostolic church, it's amazing to the same parallels that today grips the church of the living God. Hey, now don't let me... Uh, I, I'm not going to preach negatively this afternoon. we got a church. There is a blood-washed church. There is a spirit-filled church. There is a revival church. There is a beautiful bride. And the eyes of God are upon her this afternoon. She's going up to meet the Lord in the air. There is a church. It's not going down. It's going up. Some things have crept in on us slowly, in a subtle way, in a subtle manner, quietly. They did not announce themselves. When the devil saw that he could not destroy the apostolic church with persecution, when he found out that letting them die in the Roman Colosseum, you've never stood in the Colosseum at Rome. You need to go there sometime. Stand. The tour guide tried to deny it because she knew that that harlot church was guilty. She tried to deny it. Now she said, the Christians were not slaughtered here. That's a lie. They poured their blood out in the dust of that Roman Colosseum. And they stood and heard the jeering of a bloodthirsty crowd and the cries of a crowd. And they listened to the roaring animals behind the bars that were about to be loosed to, to leap upon them and spill their blood and lifted their head toward heaven and would not deny the Lord of glory. Polycarp died at the stake rather than to deny the Lord of God of glory. But when the devil saw that persecution wouldn't kill it, Hey, I get a little concerned about some of us. The Bible says if you live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. Said you will. If you don't feel any, maybe, maybe you're not living godly in Christ Jesus. Maybe that's where the problem is. If you don't feel it, they tell me this, said Polycarp, invited his captors in when they came to come, came to get him. He had a meal spread. Oh, there's a, 
There's a message in that. He spread a bountiful table, asked him to come in and sit down, dine with him in his last meal. Tradition says this. I don't know. And it's said that Polycarp asked them, may I pray over my food? They said, oh, sure, old man. Go ahead. Polycarp prayed for two hours. He had them all on their knees repenting when he got done praying. If it hadn't been for Caesar and that bumping for Reich, they'd have turned him loose. Now I'll run into that every little bit. Wave your hand, Brother Blade. Where are you? Is Captain Hill a colonel? Colonel? Captain. Well, I've had a lot of colonels and the general too. Mormon chaplain sat in my office the other day. Well, it's been a month maybe. He had seen how some of my young men stand at Fort Riley. Came to talk to me. He looked the thing over. He said, uh, Preacher, he said, what are you going to do when this is gone, when you're gone? In other words, the implication was, oh man, when you die, when you're gone, this is going to fall apart. That was the implication. He said, what are you going to do then? I said, I'm raising me some lion whelps. I said, I'm raising me some lion whelps. Let me tell you, this church ain't going to die. And it ain't going down. It's going up. There will be a church when Jesus comes. And I'm going to be in it. I'm going to be in it. I said, I'm going to be in it. Preaching about that church in the ground. My God, I preached identical twins. If the one that's in the ground, if the one that's on earth does not resemble that one that's in the ground, then the one that's on earth is not the church. My God. There's a saying of going around in political circles, where's the beef? If we could resurrect Paul, he might say, where's the church? Show me the church! I'm preaching voices from the dead. I'm going to tell you, I've been in this 30 years. That's not very long. Seemed like yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. I've thought about it. I've watched things develop down through the years. You hear me now? I can remember when the assemblies of God, I don't mind calling names, Jesus did. He said, you Pharisees, he didn't mind. I can remember when the assemblies of God had the same holiness standard that I preach at home. They had long-haired ladies, no makeup on their face, dresses. They preach you got to repent of your sin. you got to be baptized in that. Well, not baptized. you got to get wet in that non-existent trinity. They preach you got to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost and talk in tongues or you're going to bust hell wide open. But I watch the deterioration of that group of people till today. All you got to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved.
that twofold child of hell in Baton Rouge. And I won't let my wife play his tape in my car. She insists I'll throw her out. Not just the tape. No, I couldn't do that. My God. I'd be lost. Finally found a woman that put up with me. My mother didn't raise any fools. Finally found one didn't care how I, Hey, she's blind. She don't know how ugly I am. She thinks I'm good looking. Don't you tell her any different now. You better not tell her any different. She thinks I'm good looking. My Lord, she thinks I'm smart. Don't you tell her how, how dumb I am. Don't nobody tell on me, will you? Let her go ahead. Let her die in her ignorance. <coughs> my, my. Now i got to get to preaching. The parallel of the apostolic church. When the devil saw he could not kill him with persecution. Then he loved him to death. And it wasn't long till Tertullian and all of them began to stand up and in their own ranks. Honey, listen to me. Listen to me now. You better hear me now. I don't mind the persecution. I can back the commanding general of Fort Riley in a corner. I can set four bird colonels on a bench and preach to them. I've been to nine court martials and sat in the witness stand and, uh, uh, and defended this gospel and defended men that would not roll up their sleeves and got court martialed and kicked out of the army because they would not roll up their sleeves. And I've never preached long sleeves, but it seems like when they reach a certain place in God, they'll come to me, say, Brother Westberg, I, I don't feel right. My arms feel bare. Maybe if your arms don't feel there, you don't have enough of God in you yet. You hear me? I said if your arms don't feel there, maybe you don't have enough of God in you yet. Come on, preach to us. if we all got the same Holy Ghost. Uh, people begin to rise up in their own midst speaking perverse things. If the Lord tells, we're going to see those that wear the United Pentecostal banner and they've got, a, they've got a fellowship card in their billfold that will ridicule some of our ladies because of their pale faces and their godly dress. They're going to be ridiculed from within our own ranks, and it ain't going to be long. I can stand the world, but when my own brother sells me out, When my own brother sells me out. Come on, man. I've said this to more important men than any of you. None of your business who. Sister Poe stood up in Bible study said, Preacher, how about Ephesians 2 and 8? For by grace are you saved. I knew she was a Baptist. I swung into a Bible study on grace. She come back Sunday morning, brought her husband. 
Come back Sunday night. Both of them baptized. Monday. Monday. You hear me now? You listening? Monday. No hard-headed, ignorant, narrow-minded, holiness preacher had ever said anything to her. In her own apartment, in her own house, reading her own Bible. She read about in Timothy the well of gold. She looked down in her finger. The Holy Ghost said, that's gold. God said, if you pull it off, I'll give you the Holy Ghost. She pulled it off. I wonder if we all got the same Holy Ghost. Ah, sit down, sit down, shut up. Oh, I forgot. Hush, hush, hush. Uh, there's visitors here. I, I forgot. Hush. If it was mine, I'd say shut up. Now, her husband come home. That's when my phone rang. She said, Brother Westberg, my husband's upset. Now, she said, was that God? I said, yeah, Sister Poe. But I said, now, you just, every time that man brings it up, you just say, well, honey, let's pray. Don't fuss with him. Don't argue with him. Don't fight with him. Pat him on the cheek. Be sweet. Say, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. The next afternoon in her kitchen, standing at her sink, stereo playing gospel music, she raised her hands, and God filled her with the Holy Ghost in her kitchen. Have we all got the same Holy Ghost? Some of you are so hard-hearted. When you hear it preach, you'll say, Well, it don't bother me. I know I'm a saint killer. I know I'm a new convert killer. Two of them prayed through. I never had time to preach against that pipeline from hell. Come to church and say, Oh, Brother Westbrook, we've done something. We've done. Well, I thought, Oh, my God, they, they've done something. I, I said, Come on, come in. Come in my office. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Ooh. They got in there and I said, now, 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 what did you do? What did you do? What did you do? Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. Well, I was prepared for the worst. I thought maybe they'd rob the first national. They said, well, we was watching television. Said, all of a sudden we began to feel so bad. Said, we just went over and turned it off and unplugged it and turned it to the wall. Was that wrong? Do we all have the same Holy Ghost? I know I'm hard. I know I'm bitter. I know I'm mean. And I ain't going to change. <laughs> While I'm thinking about that, you sweet man, if you don't like this, you vote me out. You do both of us a favor and vote me out. Because I ain't going to change. I told my church the other night, I said I won't be threatened. I will not be coerced. I will not be intimidated. I will not be pressured. won't heal you, Brother Bear. It's the name and faith in the name that's going to heal you. Holiness ain't going to save you, per se. The name and faith in the name. But Jesus told that man that laid at Solomon's porch, 
When he got healed, he said, Go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. If God heals you, you better live for God. You better get some holiness in you. There's a lot of folks going to be in hell that got their healing. I preached the backslider's funeral two weeks ago or a week or so ago. Drowned in Lake Milford. I hope his brother's not here, but if he is, he's here. Sinner man pulled him out of the water. He said, I never saw such a look of horror upon a man's face in my life. And he said his arms were froze stiff straight up when we pulled him out of the water. And he said, I'll be in church Sunday morning, but he wasn't. But he wasn't. There's been a lot of folks that talked in tongues and shouted and went down in the water in Jesus' name that are going to be in hell. You better get you some holiness in you when you've been born again and live for God. It'll save you. It'll save you. If you ever get your hidden, you better get some holiness in you lest the worst thing Come upon you. Jesus said our worst thing. Come upon you. There was a time in our ranks. He was a tongue talking apostolic. You got persecuted. I've had men fired off their jobs for preaching. I gotta tell them keep your mouth shut till you get on steady. Don't preach till you get on steady. When you get over that probation period, pour it on their dirty hide. Now, I know that's not the right way to do it. I know I'm clumsy. I know I'm stupid. I know I'm doing it all wrong. Not too long ago, we had an evangelist. That old boy preached. There was a woman standing down there in gauchos. She had enough jewelry hanging on her to build another calf. And by the way, I can see enough at General Conference to build another calf. Hello? She was painted up. She had that old blue stuff on her eyes, so thick that the tears, she was crying blue tears. Blue tears was running down her cheeks. She was a praying like her feet was in the fire, and they probably were. And in a minute, she come through a talking in tongues. And there wasn't nobody shaking her head and screaming in her ear, telling her, repeat after me, Brother Bam. She had her feet in the fire. And she was praying like her feet was in the fire. And she came through a talking in tongues. You could, If you could have got everybody to shut up and not have been a miracle, you could have heard her across the church a talking in tongues. And it wasn't no do diddy, do diddy, do diddy. I said to the evangelist next night, he said, oh, I didn't see her. He said, I didn't either. Oh, I thought, I've got to go find her. So I was we trying to find her card, see what her name and address was. And second night rolled around, and he said, hey, he said, I believe I see her back there. And you know why we missed her? She looked so much like a saint, you couldn't tell the difference. She had a, what little bit of hair she had was pulled back. And she didn't have any of that stuff on her. And the gauchos were gone, and the jewelry was gone. Let me tell you something. Somebody said, I'm worried about all the television creeping in the church. 
Honey, there ain't one television set in the church. I said there ain't one television set in the church. There might be some people are sitting on the pew with one in their house, but there ain't none in the church. There ain't no pantsuit wearing women in the church. There ain't no effeminate homosexual man in the church. You might have some on the pew, but they're not in the church. I was preaching the other night. My God, the devil hears you. The devil hears you. Never had a church split. By God, the devil hears you. God's blessed me. Never had anybody rise up against me. Oh, my God. The devil hears you. I said, we fix to have a church split. I could read the little mind. He said, who's he going to run off now? <laughs> Somebody said, you think the UPC will ever split, honey? It's a cinch. When the trumpet sounds, it's going to split. When the trumpet sounds, faith tabernacle will split. Because not everybody on the pew is going to go up. We're going to have the greatest church split you ever seen in your life. Now, in the early church, my wife's daddy, sweet old man, never had a fellowship card in his life. If anybody ever went to heaven, the favorite P. Oswald. You know, I've heard him tell stories, chunking hogs in the windows, riding horses through the tents. Fire and apostolics, run them out of town. We had that era of persecution in our ranks. We went through it. The apostolic church of today went through persecution, and they fought it. But now we're living in the era when men are arising in our own ranks, speaking perverse things. And the grievous wolves are running the ridges out there a howling. Now you leave the tape on. I'm fixing to say this. You hear me? There are wolves outside of this district running the ridges and howling. They don't like what they see here. They'd like to see it like it is where they are. You ain't going to hear preaching like this down there or over there. There's a dirty, vile, perverse spirit working in us not to preach it, but honey, I'm going to preach it till I die. When you quit preaching it, you lost it. I got to preaching at home not long ago, and I really got mad at the devil. I shook my fist at the devil. I said, if you cut my throat, 
I'll talk in tongues and spew blood all over you while I'm a dying. But I ain't going to change. You hear me? In fact, I'm getting a little meaner. Now, some of you don't believe this. If some of you don't believe it, you're goofy. You can believe it or not. There's some godly men sitting on that board. We've had the Holy Ghost sweep in there and get to weeping and talking in tongues and praying and the business had set. Let me tell you something else. We've got a spiritual leader. And I'm content and confident to place my soul in his care. You want me to say that again? I'm going to digress long enough. Preach Haney's railroad sermon. Somebody going to drive the train that I ride on. I want some gray in his hair. I want somebody that can look down the track and read the signals. And keep me on the right track, not get me off on a siding. Keeps a steady hand on the throttle. I need somebody that driving the train that I'm going to ride. If I ever got on a 727, Brother Bayer, some little smart, <laughs> immature, adolescent dude with an Adam's apple sticking out, was walking up the gangway of that plane and his cap down over his ears, reading the book on how to fly an airplane. I'm going to say, get my baggage off. I ain't riding this thing. I want somebody that knows what they're doing if they're going to fly my airplane. I want you to hear what came out of some godly men's hearts. Most of them are dead. Most of them are in the grave. But I wanted to speak to you this afternoon. Read, Brother Beckton. We wholeheartedly disapprove. We wholeheartedly disapprove of our people indulging. Indulging. In any activities. Any activities. Which are not conducive. Not conducive. To good Christianity. Good Christianity. And godly living. And godly living like as what? Oh, now listen. Wait, hold on. Everybody likes to preach holiness. It's like the old preacher told the young one. He said, oh, man. He said, preach against sin, but be careful not name any of it. <laughs> Everybody likes to preach holiness. But you can't find many that will name it. Now always here. Holiness of spirit. I believe in holiness of spirit. But it said, Wherefore, brethren, cleanse yourselves of all filthiness of the flesh. It named the flesh before it named the spirit. Said, Present your body. Present your body. Present your body. A living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Should glorify God in your body. In your body and your spirit. Men, let me blow. Hold that manual now. Let me blow some of that Pharisee stuff out of your mind. The most loose, liberal, two-thirds Baptist in our ranks. The charismatic will look at him and call him a Pharisee. You believe a little more than somebody else. You are 
Pharisee. Paul said, I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisee. Let me tell you what a Pharisee was. Hold that manual. Get me Matthew 23 and 1. I'm going to tell you what a Pharisee is. I want to blow that Pharisee trash out of your mind. I'm going to tell you what a Pharisee is. Read, Brother Baxter. Read. You're slowing my wife. Then spake Jesus. Hey, who's talking? Our Jesus that Brother Bear preached about. Then said Jesus to the multitude. To the multitude. And to his disciples. He didn't preach it in some cloistered Bible study on a Wednesday night. He said it to the multitude. What did he say? Saying the scribes and the Pharisees. The Methodists and the Baptists. Sit in Moses' seat. They are sitting in Moses' seat, the Pharisees. Oh, I'm going to use Brother Muncy's seat. Read. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe. What? Whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. Hey, the Pharisees had the message. I said the Pharisees had the message. They were telling them right. Jesus said what, they, what they're preaching, do it. What he said. But the Pharisees' problem was he'd preach it, but he wouldn't live it. Like some of these great conference preachers. Preach holiness till the world looks level. But you go visit their church. Take a look at their wife. Take a look at their children. That's a Pharisee that'll preach it and preach it right, but won't live it. If you don't believe I live it, come live with me. If you don't believe I preach it, come look at my folks. I've got a right to preach it. And I'm going to preach it till I die. Now, give me back in that manual again and pick it up. We wholeheartedly disagree with any activities Read. which are not conducive to good Christianity and godly living such as. Such as. I'm going to preach the such as. Theaters. What? Theaters. Theaters. Hold it right there. When I was a boy, you went to the free movie in the country town on a Saturday night. You were backslid, honey. Now they bring the movies into church. They are putting church clothes on sin. told one dude none of your business. He said, what do you think they're talking about? The popcorn in the lobby? Theaters are not, movies are not conducive to Christian living. Read on. Dances. Well, if you put roller skates on and play gospel music, Come on, straighten me out. Put your arm around the same girl, but you got wheels and gospel rock to help you out. Dancing. The devil, the devil stole it out of the church and put it in the disco. The devil stole dancing out of the church. Put it in the disco. We took it out of the disco. We're going to put it back in the church. Read. 
mixed bathing? Dog. Three. <laughs> Women cutting their hair. Oh. My Lord, we had some hard-nosed ancestors. Oh, now they bring it up in the back and bring it over and tip it up. Looks like it's cut, but... Oh, it's not cut now. I just looked. Hey, honey, when it gets to looking like it, it won't be long. I told my women... The first one of you walks in here wearing a hairdo like that. There ain't room enough for you and me both in here. And I've been here a long time. <laughs> Women cutting their hair. God's interested in your hair. He had the, he had the apostle write about hair. It's in the book. It's in the manual. Read on. Make up. Up. I'm going to say it. You can like it or love it. You're wearing lip gloss. You're wearing lipstick. If you're wearing lip gloss, you wear lipstick. Now I'm going to say something. And you listen carefully now. And you have working on you. I didn't say you were possessed with it now. And I said you have working in you and working on you the spirit of a harlot. The spirit of a harlot is working on you. And anybody that likes lip gloss has got the spirit of a whoremonger working on them. I told my ladies, you want to know what to put on your face? Soap and water! Soap and water! You can't improve on what God done. I said you can't improve on what God done. You see, these things come in a little at a time. I'm going to get on them sleeves. I had my old pastor preach for me two Sundays ago. I told him, I said, man, you put these long sleeves on my arms. I prayed through and the church had tie bars and cuff links and rings and bro, it had everything in it. Glad God got me out of that. I said, you put these long sleeves on me. Took my tie bar off, cufflinks. He done it. God bless his heart. I love him. Married my wife and I. I wouldn't care what he done, I still love him. If I wouldn't care if he went out and sinned, I'd love him. I'd love him. I love his old bald head. Let me tell you something. Cut the tape off. Cut the tape off. Man. I wouldn't want him to hear that. Sweetest man. My, my, my. Now, let me get back to sleep. Been an awful battle at Fort Riley over sleeves. I don't know how many of them's here. Every one of you been chaptered out over your sleeves. Stand up. 
That ain't even a tenth of it. I'd say 40, 40 maybe. Sit down, sit down. Now, I've had colonels come in, say, Reverend Westberg, what is there about sleeves? And uh, I'd say, well, Colonel, Chaplain, it's this way. Every man is going to have to face God with his own conscience. Now, I said, I don't preach this. I don't preach it. It's true, I don't preach it. Is that right? But I said, invariably, when those young men reach a certain place in God, they come to me. They say, Brother Westberg, I'm not going to roll my sleeves up anymore. I said, now wait a minute, you know what's going to happen? They're going to give you an Article 15. If you sign it, it'll be stockade and extra duty and stockade and extra duty. You get out of that, they'll give you another direct order to roll up your sleeves. It'll be another Article 15 and so on and so on. If you don't sign the Article 15, we're going to a court-martial. I said, they'll bust you and kick you out on a Chapter 5 or a Chapter 13. That's what you're facing now. I'll stand behind you. Told the colonel, I said, read on a little bit. I'll get, get down to that modesty. Well, let me hit it right now. I said, modesty is a, that's a wide panoramic su uh, subject. You, you know, it covers a lot of territory. When, uh, when you're down in the, in the bar room and the go-go dancers up there flipping and twisting and gyrating, a G-string and two pedals are modesty. She's modest. Some circles, a one-piece bathing suit is modesty. Because she's not wearing a bikini, she's modest. Some circles. Now, God is interested in clothing. That's the first thing he done to Adam and Eve. Their little old G-string apron wasn't enough. He clothed them. And the word in the Greek means from wrist to neck to ankle. God hates nudity. He cursed Ham for it. Deuteronomy is full of look not on so-and-so's nakedness. Look not on so-and-so's nakedness. God hates nakedness. Now, if God loves for you to cover your body, you find your own place in God. That you can live with. You sure are looking at me. You sure are looking at me. Let me tell you something. If we get up before the throne of God, and it could have been somebody there walked around with their hairy stomach sticking out, one button buttoned on their shirt. And if they're there, I'm not going to get mad at God and say, throw him out. But I'm going to tell you something else. I'm going to get close enough to God where I know I'm not playing Russian roulette with my soul. I'm not going to leave any question. I'm not going to leave any doubt. You come to me and ask me if it's so and so wrong. I say, if there's a question in your mind, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Cut it off. Put it away from you. Jesus said, if it offends you, cut it off. 
I got to preaching at home not long ago. You know, out in the western United States where I used to punch cows. I used to punch cows. Right in the same county Billy the Kid grew up in. If a snake bit you, old boy looked down and saw those two blue holes where the fangs had gone in and he knows, he knows, he's got to get that venom out of him or it's going to spread through his entire body and he's going to be dead. He'll whip out his knife and he'll cut a notch. It don't matter how much it hurts, he'll cut a notch and begin to suck that venom out before it gets him. Some of you have got worldliness in you. You got things in you you need to get out before it destroys you. Now these things crept in so slowly on us, almost unnoticed. Read on, Brother Beckton. Modesty. I'm going to cover my body till I know it pleases God. Hey, let me get one thing more. I hear this well. It's so hot. Honey, I worked for a construction company in North Africa for 18 months. And those Arabs, where it really gets hot. Hey, I've had the Sirocco blow in off of that desert. And that wind that gets so hot in those plywood huts, you couldn't tell the hot water from the cold water. That hot wind that blow through there, steel chair sitting in the shade, it gets so hot. You couldn't sit in it. You, you don't know nothing about heat. And those Arabs, look at them in the paper. Neck to wrist to ankle. The women cover the face. Don't tell me it's too hot. You got to pull your clothes off because it's hot. Don't throw that trash at me. I've seen women out there jogging in shorts when there was frost on the ground. It's not a matter of staying cool or staying hot. It's a matter of lust. I said it's a matter of lust. You women uncovering your bodies to entice a man. You got the spirit of a heart working on you. Hear me? I don't care if you're 13 and pretty. Might have been better for you if you'd have born, been born with buck teeth, cauliflower ears, and a nose like Jimmy Durante's. You might have made heaven if you hadn't have been so pretty. I said you might have made heaven if you hadn't have been so pretty. Ain't going to be no blood on my hands when I leave here today. I'm going to be pure from the blood of all men when I leave here today. Read on, Brother Beckton. Any apparel that immodestly exposes the body. Any. Now, over there in Isaiah, where God was hitting on all of that jewelry, got down to changeable suits of apparel. Them dudes will run by every bit of that jewelry. Rings and bracelets and leg, and leg things and wrist things and nose things. And they say, how about that change of our suits of apparel? Well, Adam Clark said they were transparent, see-through garments, and I preach against those also. Changeable suits of apparel were transparent, See through garments. Any clothing. Any clothing. That's the voice of the grave is speaking to us. That's old timers that prayed and sought God and wrote that down for our direction. 
That's the voice from the grave is speaking to you today. Read on to the back seat. In all, clothing. All worldly sports and amusements. Ah, tell me which ones are godly. All worldly sports. Which ones are godly? Which ones are scriptural? Tell me which ones. Tell me. All worldly sports. Read on. And unwholesome radio programs and music. Ooh. Now let me tell you when that was written. That was written when Bill Monroe and his bluegrass boys was a singing bluegrass. That was written way back there when Lefty Frizzell was getting his start in Bossier City, Louisiana. That was written way back there when Hank Williams was driving his Cadillac. You didn't hear nothing but country and music and bluegrass. Oh, worldly music. Was G.T. Haywood didn't write it. I wouldn't sing it unless somebody godly. Now, I believe those old Methodists was as godly as, as they knew how, and I'm going to get on that after a while. Read on. Furthermore, because of the display of all these evils on television, we oh, disapprove. Oh, oh, now, those poor old narrow-minded fellas knew in the Spirit. But, hey, now sinners ungodly sinners that would curse God are against television. They're against it. But our forefathers in the Spirit knew it. They're crying to us from the grave today. Read on, Brother Beck. We disapprove of any of our people having television sets in their homes. Now they had to water that down. When you see recommend and disapprove, there was a hard nosed bunch that wanted to say, We'll throw you out if you do. But there was another bunch in there that wasn't quite that hard nosed. And they kept a hassling and a hassling till they got it down to disprove and recommend. They've used recommend so many times. In that book, I almost recommend throwing it in the trash. I recommend. Brother Muncy, forgive me. Pray for me. I'll still do it. I've done it. I'm guilty. I recommend if you don't do what I say, I'll pitch you out on your ear. That's what I recommend. Forgive me, Brother Muncy. I know you preached against it. I'm sorry. Forgive me, I'm hard-headed, I'm stupid, but that's the way it is. Ah, my, 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 recommend. Now, in closing, I'm going to get revival. Praise God. I appreciate it. Brother Cornwell's burden, what he said up here about revival. My wife and I have talked and dreamed. And Brother Elder, I've drove through those towns too. And I, my wife and I have talked and dreamed about a powerful, vibrant, spiritual church in every little city in Hamlet in this great state of Kansas, and I'm a Texan. We, 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 we talked and we, we prayed. And I'm with you. I'm with you, whole mission pastor. I know what you're fighting. I had two sweet families, three members when I come. Two sweet families, still with me and still sweet. I know what it is. I know the fight that you're fighting in. My greatest dream was, no, maybe four or five move-in families will come along and 
but I'll have a great church. And then I got to thinking maybe some powerful evangelist will come by and preach me a great revival and sweep a hundred souls in here and I'll have a great revival. I'm going to tell you where it's going to start. Oh, mission pastor. You draw a circle and get right in the middle of it. That's where it's going to start. I got tired of waiting on those evangelists. They was running off to the high churches where they could get that big offering, that, that darjo, as the French say, the dinero, as the Spanish say, the flutes, as the Arab says. And I was waiting on one, but they were high flying and high rolling in the big churches. And I said, I'm going to have mine. They can go, but I'm going to have mine. And the move-in families would move out. And they'd drive off and leave me and say, bye, Brother Westberg. But hey, I said, I'm going to have it. I'm going to have it. I'm going to tear it out by the hand of the devil. It's mine. I'm going to have it. Thirty years, I've, had, I've heard every wild soothsayer in the world come by and tell me how to have revival. If we're not careful, we're going to lose everything we got in the name of revival. Video and movies and that trash is going to steal everything we've got in the name of revival. I've heard a hundred soothsayers tell me how to have revival. There's one more thing yet for them to try. And I've got the Word of God with me. And I've got history with me. The revivals of Moody. The revivals of Wesley. The revivals of all of those old reformers started with two things. A return to the Word of God and a return to God's standard of holiness. And if you will return to the Word of God and return to the standard of God's holiness, God will give you a revival. Why don't they try it? They've tried everything else. Let me tell you something. This ain't popular, but I'm going to preach it. You know why? 300 are swept in and 30 stay. Heard a young man say not long ago, he's tired of hearing that. They didn't get what I got. When you're born, you're born. All births are the same. I dispute that. There are premature births. And the baby dies because it is born prematurely. And in a premature birth, they have not spent enough time in the womb of the mother. These are premature births. They're swept in, born prematurely. They have not had enough time in the womb of the church. They have not spent enough time in the womb of the church. They are born prematurely. That's why we hear that trash new convert. Discipleship courses. Putting them in an oxygen tent. Trying to help them survive to get a little strength in them. You let me have them three weeks in the womb of the mother. You let them feel the warmth in the womb of the mother. You let them hear the word come while they're sitting in the womb of the mother. And they'll come in loud and strong. They'll be crying out of Father and they'll be healthy. Don't you tell this old boy he don't know what he's talking about. I'm right whether you believe it or not. Dying of a premature birth. Get him in the womb of the mother. Let him develop in the womb of the mother. Don't repent. Premature birth. Have not developed in the womb of the mother. 
You let me give them the Bible studies. I use home Bible study. I'd rather get 40 of them in on a Sunday morning and teach them myself. Send some novice out there. Bring them to a premature birth. Somebody's living room. I use home Bible studies. I'm not against home Bible studies, Brother Cornwell. I use them. I use them. Not folks sitting there. Come in, home Bible study. But you let me get them in the womb of the mother. You let them feel the warmth of the mother. You let them develop in the womb of the mother. They're going to come through loud, strong, and healthy. In the Word of God. When they found the Word of God in the house of God, they went out and began to tear down their images, put away their strange wives. Oh, oh honey, we got some strange wives walking around in our midst. They put away their strange wives, begin to return to the Word of God and the holiness of God, begin to worship God. When you get what you got, let me tell you something. If you don't have a burden for the lost, you don't have the Holy Ghost. You got a fluid drive, charismatic spirit if you don't love the lost. You did not get the Holy Ghost if you don't love the lost. God called every one of you to preach. I've had young men, Brother Wesley, oh, Brother Brother, call and preach. God give you the Holy Ghost. He called you to preach. I don't mean your pastor's pulpit. Get out there on the street corner. Get on the job. Wherever you are, cross the fence. Get on it! Get on it! Get on it! We'll have revival when it means more to us than an evening meal. Now tell me, I shoveled hogs to eat in the mill all day long and came home and mowed the lawn and had Bible study, cleaned the church. Wife and I are both working. Make the, ch make the church note. Don't tell me how hard it is. I've been down, been a 30 foot down in a wooden bin, 10 by 10, no windows. And the, the air was 30 feet up there in the Kansas summertime, shoveling hog feed into an auger and a sweat and a hog feed running down in my eyes. And that smart smirking. Something over there accused me of not getting my hands dirty the other day. My God, I had trouble controlling my temper. She said, you don't get your hands dirty. My God, have mercy. She said, I, I look up and say, God, what do you got me here for? What am I doing here? And go home and, and preach to a handful when I was so tired. I was about to run down in my socks and evaporate. I, I was so tired and wiped out. And, hey, we got out and knocked doors. I said, my wife and I got out and knocked doors, and we're still doing it. Riding in a Cadillac don't change you. If you got the Holy Ghost, you'll be out knocking doors. If you got the Holy Ghost, you will. Don't tell me how tough it is. You need to get some Holy Ghost tough in you. I said, get you some Holy Ghost tough in you. Now I'm going to quit. I know you're hungry. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things. Brother, Brother Chalfin is fighting that now in the Harvard School of Divinity. Men that have been through ABI once knew this truth. Studying to be Episcopal priests, 
Baptist preachers. Brother Chalford told me, I read the paper, I read the book, the man named Brother Saban and S.G. Norris in the paper. He said, I attended ABI. I thought, without more the Lord, I thought, my God, what kind of a man would know the truth and have the truth down in him and turn against it? God spoke to me, and I went in the house, and I called Brother Chalfin. I said, Brother Chalfin, I said, God just spoke to me. You're walking into a nest of homosexuals up there. You better watch yourself. I said, you're walking into a nest of homosexuals, men that will turn to a reprobate mind, that will deny the truth, nothing but a rotten homosexual up there studying to be an Episcopal priest that would turn against the truth, but they're standing up in our midst. The enemy is inside of us. It's within our own ranks. Men standing up amongst your own selves. I'm going to read you the 32nd verse. And now, brethren, I commend you to God. Can't save you. Can't save you. I commend you to God, to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. 36th verse, and when he had thus spoken, we kneeled down and prayed with them all. Everyone in the building, stand. Oh, is dead. Peter is dead. Peter is not buried under the altar in St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican in Rome. If they had buried Peter there, he'd have got up and walked away from there. That's not Peter. That's another Catholic lie. you heard the voice of dead men crying to you from the grave. I wonder, Brother Bear, Paul and Peter were to walk into this sanctuary this afternoon. A wonderful J.T. Haywood, C.P. Kilgore, some of our old giants of the faith were to come back from the grave, walk into our midst, walk into our so-called churches. I wonder what they would say to us today. Do you suppose that someone would come to Paul? Say, Paul, don't preach against lip gloss. Peter's wife is wearing it. Paul said, I withstood Peter to his face. I don't care who it is. Amongst our ranks are wearing it, honey. They've got the spirit of a harlot working on them. And it may possess them. Before they're done. Can you imagine somebody saying to Peter, don't write that about outward adornment? Silas's wife wears a wedding band. You imagine Peter holding back? Huh? You imagine that? Soft pedal the message because of somebody's wife, somebody's children, somebody's church, somebody's theology. Hey, we'll find out who's right when we stand before God. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be living and preaching in the place where I can stand and meet him face to face with a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. God bless you.